Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the market participants panel. So I'm Iman Ramouni Rousseau. I'm the Director General for Market Operations uh, at the ECB. And uh, in this market participants panel, the uh, idea is to get market insights on the topics that have been covered uh, in the other sessions from the academic point of view. Yeah. So we will organize that in a dialogue with my panelists that would be as interactive as possible and keep you entertained for about an hour. So I'm very fortunate uh, to be today to be joined uh, by a very uh, distinguished set of panelists to help me you know, uh, dissecate uh, the implications of uh, the very unusual cycle of monetary policy normalization uh, across the globe on money markets. And uh, I will introduce them in turn, starting with Fabio Natalucci. Fabio is the Deputy Director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department, MCM, at the IMF. He's responsible for the very well-known Global Financial Stability Report of the IMF. And in today's panel, we will benefit from Fabio's excellent knowledge of central bank policies, both in the US and across the globe. Camille de Corcel. Camille is the head of strategy for G10 rates at BNP Paribas. She is an expert watcher of central bank decisions and their repercussions for money markets. She will enlighten this panel with her excellent understanding of research and policy choices. Eric Scotto Di Rinaldi. Eric is head of liquidity management at Rabobank and a member of the ECB Money Market Contact Group. In today's panel, Eric will bring the sell side perspective and how banks adapt to the new environment of higher rates. And finally, Mikhail Paco. Mikhail is head of Euro sovereigns and money markets at AXA Investment Managers, the investment management arm of AXA managing almost a trillion of assets. Mikhail will bring perspectives from the buy side and represent the non-bank community in our discussion with a particular position in money markets. So we'll start with uh, the topic of the day, which is basically central bank normalization uh, and how this impact um, excess liquidity in the system and money markets more generally. So. All major central banks today are uh, fighting uh, uh, an exceptionally uh, high uh, level of inflation and a very uncertain inflation outlook with acceler an accelerated pace of rate hikes. And they are also engaged in uh, the reduction of the size of their balance sheets. So, question for the panelists, what are the implications of the different speed and modalities of normalization across central banks? And, and how does this impact money markets? In particular, if we look across the globe uh, and turning to central banks that are already well advanced in their cycle, is there any particular reason, uh, lesson to draw from the Fed uh, and from other central banks that have um, started their normalization cycle earlier uh, than the euro area? And maybe I'll start with uh, Fabio for his perspectives. Fabio. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I think the Fed can be a useful comparison for two reasons. Uh, one is because they already hiked the policy rate quite a bit. So as you have seen yesterday, another 75 basis points. Now we are 4%. And Chair Powell made clear that it's way to go still. But also because they were the only previous central bank they actually did try to normalize policy uh, back in 1719, right? So what they do, the size of the balance sheet, the Fed now, it's about 8.7 trillion. Uh, on the SOMA portfolio, they have about 5.6 trillion of treasuries, and then there's another 2.7 of MBS. And then on the liability side, uh, there's about 3.1 billion of bank of reserves, um, about 2.5 trillion of uh, overnight RRP, and then there's about 650 billion of uh, the Treasury uh, general account. So the system works in an autopilot essentially. It's a cap system. Once we hit the cap, they're only going to reinvest above the cap. So far, QT has progressed normal, uh, but quite smoothly. Um, monthly declines were smaller at the beginning related to the cap, but now I think that we are exactly where they, they designed it to be. On, just to give you a sense, Treasury have declined about 160 billion so far uh, since the QT has started, and about 30 billion of MBS. 
Um, the, the composition of the liability is always interesting in the sense that the sum of portfolio has declined not too much, but we have seen a significant increase in over IRRP. Uh, and so our IRRP, it's about now, as I said, uh, two point, um, uh, sorry, over IRRP now is about uh, 2.5 trillion and reserve 3.1. So the composition side, I think it's something that's important to look at, because if you look at where reserves are today compared to where they were in 19, you could think that there is a long way to go before you reach some potential equilibrium. But they are, in fact, um, it depends how the, the composition side is going to play out in terms of an IRP versus reserves. Uh, and QT is expected to pick up in 2023 with about 650 billion of contraction on the treasury portfolio and about 300 for the, the MBS. Now, why there has been this increase over an RRP is because money market fund participation has increased very quickly because money funds rates and yield are much closer to market rates. So they follow the federal fund rate much quicker than what we have seen instead in the bank deposit rate. And so there's been a huge influence into money market funds, particularly prime, uh, the decline has been a decline of the maturity of what they hold, and in part because there are no many alternatives out there. So net T-bill issuance is negative, and so without that and with repo rates quite low, in some sense, over an IRP becomes the best option that you have out there in terms of investment. Our bank deposit have declined about 200 billion, but as I said, the increase in the deposit rate has been quite slow. That's why money market funds are, are so attractive. Uh, the one point that maybe you can come back later, but the Federal Reserve now, it's also accruing net negative income, uh, which means that in terms of what they pay on the liability side versus what they receive on the asset side, income is now negative. And there are some projection that that could uh, actually uh, arise. The way this is done from an accounting standpoint, they book what is called the fair asset effectively. So you defer positive income uh, to the future. Uh, that has result in pressure on money market funds. So we have seen, for example, unsecured spread uh, rising ahead of year end. So Fry OIS or Labor OIS, those unsecured spread have widened. Uh, but at the same time, we have seen funding pressure. So if you look at cross currency basis swap market, we have seen a significant widening in the euro dollar basis, in the yen basis, and the Swiss franc basis. This could be technical in part as we go to a year end uh, and, and come off as we across or across the year end, but it's been quite notable and more visible than I think the last uh, the last quarter end or year end. And then one last point, they have a floor system. So we have seen the federal fund rate has been within the band, well behaved, but we have seen some leaks in the floor, if you want, right? The floor is between the uh, interest rate on reserve and over an IRP. We have seen some particularly bilateral repo rates that actually have dropped below, below the floor, although as some of the specialness goes away, I think repo rates are starting to move higher. One last thing, it's the other possible comparison, maybe it's the Bank of England. Uh, they started QT this week. They scheduled to have eight auction of 750 million uh, guild. The sales are concentrated on the front end. I think trying to avoid additional pressure on the long end that we have seen in the past weeks with the pension and LDIs. They have one sale so far of 750 million. The bid to cover was 3.3. So there was a lot of demand for front end guilds. Um, and I think this is a point that perhaps we'll cover in the discussion later. There seems to be a lot of scarce collateral, so demand, demand for scarce collateral. Uh, one measure of this, if you look at uh, Ronia versus bank rate, that number is minus, about minus 40 basis points. Or if you look at swap spread at the two-year tenor, swap spread to cash guilt is about 125 basis points. So that seems to be a sign of collateral scarcity there. And the concern, of course, is that transmission of monetary policy would be impaired. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. That's a very good start. So, Camille, how do you see the broader implications for the various segments in the money markets of, of normalization? To the ECB, as we all know, uh, you know, the ECB has prioritized unwinding the TLTROs. Um, and, and the TLTROs have played a major role in exerting significant downward pressure on funding rates for the economy for banks, which had been quite visible uh, with very low Euribor rates, especially when you look at those relative to Esther. So we had a very strong compression of Esther basis uh, during 2020 and 2021, because basically the very cheap TLTROs funding have cannibalized banks' reliance to market funding. 
so we had CP issuance drop to record lows. Uh, the balance of power shifting from banks customers to uh, banks hands uh, because basically banks were already full of cash did not really need much more cash and therefore they would accept term deposit at lower rates now what we are going to see as tltros are getting repaid is an unwind of this trend uh, so we will see gradually banks return to the market Banks will also need to raise NSFR funding again, uh, especially as the maturity of TLTROs uh, quickly fall below six months. So they will rely more again on term funding, and therefore this should contribute to higher uh, Euribor rates relative to Esther, which is not at all what we are seeing right now. We have seen a bit of rewidening during the year, but at the moment there are also other consideration and some technical factors which make that uh, Euribor versus Esther is very low, but we would expect a normalization of that basis as the TLTROs are getting repaid. Uh, and then when it comes to Esther, uh, Esther is a function of excess liquidity. Uh, typically, we still see it as a convex, fu uh, convex function. So as liquidity declines uh, with the repayments of the TLTRO, we would gradually expect a, a rise in Esther, but it's likely to be quite uh, marginal in a sense that even for two trillion of repayments of the TLTROs, when everything will have mature, when everything will have been repaid, we would expect perhaps something like three bips higher uh, or three bips of tightening between Esther and the depot facility rate, but perhaps not more. Whereas for Esther bore basis, from at least from current levels, we would expect at the very least a 10 bips widening impact. So I would say with the sequencing of the ECB, which is let's tackle the TLTRO first, I think the impact is going to be more visible on unsecured funding first. No, absolutely. And I think that's a very good perspective on, you know, the money market curve. Yeah. But now when we go into pass through uh, to different segments, I mean, we see that the transmission of higher rates in the euro area has been uneven. Yeah. I mean, it's been very smooth in the unsecured segment. Also this morning, we looked at, you know, a Euro SDR after the, the start of the maintenance period yesterday, it's a perfect pass through of 75 basis points. But uh, somehow in September, we had a more bumpy ride on, on repo markets. And so the question is, taking also Fabio's point about this scarcity, this collateral scarcity issues that we see you know, not only in the euro area, but but also in other jurisdictions, the UK, the US and others. I mean, how do you expect the pass through to evolve looking forward, both, both from the sell side and, and from the buy side perspective? Because I think both of these are important. And so how do banks on the sell side pass the higher uh, central bank rates to their wholesale depositors? OK. And also uh, to repose from non-banks and, and what are the main drivers? And uh, maybe I can turn, of course, to Eric to uh, answer that first. And then I'll, I'll turn to Mikael for uh, the buy side perspective. Eric. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Imen, and thank you for the invitation. So very quickly uh, from the buy side, you said it right. When it comes to the unsecured rate, uh, at least I can speak for our institution, the transmission of the monetary policy stance is integral, uh, fully reflected in the levels that we show to the sales uh, on the screen. Um, I will, I will, I would like to add as well vis-à-vis -vis the comments that Camille made on the Esther DFR uh, basis. That indeed, I I agree with uh, her analysis that as the uh, normalization continues, we should see a little bit of tightening of that. Uh, if you do a regression you do not get very far from, let's say, uh, four, three basis points. Uh, but uh, I would like to add as well that the uh, ESTER is very driven not only by how much liquidity there is in the system, but how the liquidity is distributed in the system. Because if you look at the, uh, the way um, the uh, ESTER contribution is made, it's the financial institutions and banks currently do not inter well trade very much between themselves. Most of the volumes of ESTA are driven by non-bank FI uh, deposits. And these deposits are there for uh, residual liquidity management purposes. And Michael will probably be able to add more color to this. 
But all in all, I would say, yes, it's about the removal of the liquidity, but how does that liquidity eventually get spread out will also play a role in the tightening or widening. I do see a little bit of a risk of widening, especially as we get closer to the reporting date uh, on that basis, um, simply because there is, uh, and we, discuss, we will discuss later on about the regulatory impact, there is a, a low regulatory value assigned to the uh, overnight deposits from non-bank FIs. On the repo rate, uh, I cannot really comment because I do not have that under my remit. I'm uh, liquidity, head of liquidity management Utrecht. Um, however, having quickly discussed with the repo desk, uh, the, um, the expectation is very much that as uh, gradually the Teltro uh, gets unwound, but also quantitative tightening comes into play, there will be more uh, of the securities that are in demand released into the market, and hopefully that should help. But that's as far as I would go. And Miguel, from the buy side perspective, how do you see it? Different factors to look at when, when we are talking about the rate pass through. Uh, one is very linked to the type of instrument we are talking about. Uh, it's true that uh, when you are looking at secured or unsecured instruments, it's different. When it's funded investment, uh, uh, it's different from derivatives. Uh, we also have to, to look at uh, the fact that these instruments or some instruments can be eligible to the ECBQE or to the TLTRO operations and as such are subject to scarcity or not, depending uh, on their eligibility. Uh, if we take the example of uh, Esther or Euribor swaps, for example, we've got uh, pretty good uh, transmission from the ECB rate hikes that happened uh, uh, over the, the last few months. It's less true when we look at uh, core government uh, bonds, uh, when we look at uh, boons, uh, shats, we can see that uh, uh, they are pretty expensive and uh, it's well materialized uh, when we look at the swap spread. We had a, a significant winding versus swaps. Uh, so it shows that, uh, that there is some richness uh, in these papers. Uh, when we look at commercial papers uh, and short term credit, uh, repricing uh, has been pretty massive. So uh, we haven't seen any uh, major lag versus the past uh, of policy rates. So on that front, it, it worked pretty well. Uh, another factor to look at uh, and is that is impacting transmission uh, to, money, uh, to money market is regulatory mismatch. Uh, on that front, um, uh, we know that banks have several uh, ratios uh, to respect. Uh, these ratios uh, have been put in place to, to uh, strengthen uh, their, their financial profi profile. Uh, we can list uh, the NSFR, the LCR ratio, the leverage ratio, or the SRF contribution that will uh, take place at your end. Um, uh, these ratios are banks look at, uh, pay attention to them uh, at your end or at quarter end. Um, it implies that these banks or banks uh, that need to respect this ratio take less cash. Uh, during the, 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 the quarter and on your end, and, and it has some impact for other market actors. And uh, we can take uh, talk about uh, insurance companies, about pension funds, and money markets. And if we uh, take the example of money market fund, for example, uh, what uh, they are uh, they are facing some regulatory constraints as well. They need to to hold a pretty, pretty significant amount of cash, 7.5% on a daily basis, 15% on a weekly basis. Uh, most of the time, they, they, we run this fund with uh, more than 15% of daily cash. Uh, and the, the, the question is where we, we can park this cash. So one solution is to leave this cash at the custody account, maximum uh, 10% by uh, regulation. Uh, then we have to look at uh, reverse repo, it's eligible for the daily uh, ratio with a 24 hour call. We can look at treasury bills. They are not eligible to the daily ratio, but to the to weekly ratio. Uh, we can uh, do some overnight deposits with banks. And, uh, and the problem we, we face is uh, at quarter end and your end, when banks don't want to take more cash on their balance sheet. Uh, and uh, Eric uh, touch, uh, said a few words about it, but uh, we know that uh, this cash uh, 
is kind of a hot potato, I would say. Uh, nobody wants to take it. And then it can explain the, 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 the stress we see every quarter and every year end uh, since uh, 2015 now. Uh, we have the same stress uh, in the US. Uh, the difference is that in the US, uh, there is a reverse repo facility and money market fund use, use this facility extensively. Uh, and, uh, and Fabio told us that uh, they, 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 they deposit uh, like uh, 2.1 trillion, uh, they deposited 2.1 trillion at the end of September. Uh, we can imagine that they will do so uh, at, at your end as well. It was a, a record-breaking month, a very big amount of cash, uh, close to 50% uh, of the IUM of money market fund in the US uh, was left uh, at the facility. So it shows that uh, at least there is, a, 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 let's say, an alternative for money market fund in the US to park cash when banks don't want to take it. It's different in, in Europe. We can't do so. So we have to find other solution. Uh, and that's what we've seen since uh, mid-August, uh, tightening or reaching of T-bills, uh, widening of uh, the cross-currency, uh, euro-dollar cross-currency basis. Uh, we've seen also a tightening of uh, Japanese T-bills, uh, a few basis points. So uh, European uh, funds or money market funds try to park their cash somewhere uh, to uh, avoid uh, 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 massive uh, fees paid to, to custodian or to banks. Uh, but uh, at the end, you know, uh, it's a closed system. So you are left with uh, plenty of cash in the euro system. And then someone has to take the, the loss or pay the price. And uh, it's true uh, via all the instruments in money markets. And on yeah, that no, front, absolutely. Say... And, and maybe, uh, maybe uh, Michael, I mean, on that front, would you say that this year you are more worried year end than you were last year? I'm not very optimistic, I would say. Uh, when we look at the pricing in the market currently on reverse repo, it's like 500 basis point cost for, for the turn of the year. Uh, when we look at T-bills, uh, they have a, a premium. Uh, it went up to more than 100 basis point on the three month, six month maturities. It's back to 30, 40 basis point currently, but but I would say uh, even if TL, TLTROs are repaid for uh, 1 trillion, uh, I'm not sure it will bring uh, enough collateral in the system to, to, to cheapen uh, the repo. Uh, banks, for sure, uh, will have the SCFR, to, uh, SCFR um, uh, contribution, so won't take any more cash. So the only question is, uh, have banks done most of the job already, meaning that they have reduced their balance sheet, uh, reduced the cash, uh, try to uh, or ask institutional clients to shift to money market funds or to go elsewhere in the market. If, if it is the case, maybe it won't worsen, but, but I don't know on that front. If, if I may add, uh, Eric, if I may, yes. yeah, if I may add one quickly, uh, just, just because of the, the, the bank levy, yeah, if we look at one basis point that we are to pay as an institution, it's um, annualized, which means that over a three-day turn, each basis point that you have to pay in, lev in levy is 1.2% that you would charge, uh, you know, prorated to the number of days. So you can quickly see that if uh, I think, uh, Michael, uh, you, you, when last time we discussed, you mentioned that uh, on your uh, current accounts, sometimes you're charged 5 6%. Then when you have that rule of thumb, that's quickly understandable, right? If, if you have a few basis points, and it's also dependent on the, the location in Europe, you may have different levies that apply, you can see that uh, banks do have to face enormous costs at year end. And there isn't, as we mentioned, always a regulatory benefit of setting. So you have to manage the uh, deployment of your balance sheet. Eh? And one of the key things that we see is that the balance sheet is a finite and costly resource. Absolutely. And, and we'll come back to that. So now maybe if we you know, stay in this sequence of normalization of central banks, but we, we look a little bit further, um, at some point, uh, 
now we have plenty of reserves in the system, plenty of excess liquidity. But at some point, the question of you know demand for reserves uh, will uh, arise again, meaning that we will you know reach a point where uh, reserves um, become scarce again. And and the Fed had faced that back in two thousand and and nineteen actually, and this had you know nearly derailed uh, their normalization of the balance sheet at that point in time. So, I mean, when, when you look at this question of the demand for reserves and you see that a lot has changed uh, since the great financial crisis in terms of, you know, regulation, as you were just mentioning, with all these new uh, ratios, levies and stuff, um, how do you see banks being able to cope with lower amounts of liquidity, lower amounts of reserves in the system in this normalization uh, cycle? given uh, the shift in their funding structure and the fact that, you know, there, there are more deposits, yeah? And, and what does this imply for the minimum amount of uh, liquidity needed to anchor short-term rates? So this kind of, um, um, you know, uh, optimal level for, for reserves. Um, so maybe I can turn to you, Camille, to see, you know, in your research and so on, or what can you tell us about you know, this this uh, kind of sweet spot in terms of le demand for reserves uh, today in the euro area. Yeah, it, I, I have to say it's very hard to tell. What, what we know is that Ionia and now Esther have been very well anchored to the DFR when excess liquidity is greater than at least 700 billion. Uh, and that beyond that level, basically you have limited volatility around Ionia or again Esther. Uh, but that was indeed before, as you pointed out, and as Michael and the others have uh, mentioned, indeed, lots of regulations have been put in place since. So this threshold is likely to be higher now. Uh, by how much is it higher is quite uncertain. Uh, is it 500 billion more, so 1.2 trillion or even more? We, on our side, we have not done yet the full analysis because in any case, we feel like we are still a very long way from reaching that sweet spot, uh, as you call it. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, in our projections, you know, for example, it's very unlikely that we even go back below two trillion of excess liquidity uh, over the next five years. So at 1.7 to 1.9 trillion of excess liquidity, we would tend to feel that the DFR will still be the anchor, uh, even though we will have had by then, indeed, clearly a dramatic drop in excess liquidity. And therefore, once again, as we discussed before, it could, could push uh, Esther a bit higher. But what's important here is that the DFR is still likely to be the anchor. And therefore, for us, it's going to take uh, a very, very long time before we go back to these sort of levels. Who else would like to come in? Discussion uh, of reserves. Eric. Amen, if I may. Uh, yes. So when I was uh, at one session of the money market contact group, I, I did try to explore a little bit this question. And just as Kami pointed out, it's a very difficult one to answer. And indeed, just when you do some really, really basic checks, you think that perhaps indeed the sweet spot could be uh, at least what you don't, what you cannot tell is what happens if you tighten really very much under 1.8, 1.7 trillion. So that's exactly what Camille, say, Camille said as well. Uh, one of the things that, that I found out, and, and or at least intuitively anyway, for me, the regulations have been the main drivers to uh, the excess liquidity that we see, and the uh, requirement for the buffers, the LCR, that's the existing regulation. You look at intraday, uh, there is already uh, some regulation, like uh, look at the Bank of England, Pillar 2, the, the Swiss, as well. So there will be pressure also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, intraday, even though a lot of institutions will have access to their intraday credit limit, but they will probably prefer to have cash as reserve, no valuation element. So just the, the buffer requirements themselves will be a big contributor or one of the main drivers to the threshold and defining the sweet spot. Another one will be the uncertainty on that, on the mix uh, that you have in that buffer. So how much cash will institution hold relative to securities and what securities will be available? There, there will be a function also of the, uh, so 
the, first, the um, ability to value the securities. Uh, there will be some uh, risk management preferences. Probably you will have some risk management functions that will uh, say that they only want a certain category of bonds rather than all of the bonds. So the lack of homogeneity here will play a role. Um, and there will be also the cash, uh, sorry, the opportunity, the cost versus benefits, given we are in a positive rate world. And I did mention the risk management. That's one of the other big factors overall. Since the global financial crisis, I do get the impression that risk aversion has increased. Uh, and we'll talk more about regulation. There is a, that angle. There is a paper that I really like uh, on the uh, sweet spot. You mentioned the scarcity of reserves. It's a paper from the Fed New York. Um, it's uh, the monetary policy implementation with an ample supply of reserves. And, and in that paper, uh, one of the key things that they argue uh, is that uh, eventually the bank, the central bank will have to aim for a, a trade-off, trade-off between um, financial stability, frequency of intervention, size of intervention, and is likely to target the uh, a level of excess reserves in which the uh, demand curve is gently upward sloping, N namely that the sensitivity, if you will, uh, is not as uh, enormous, not as big. So there is a, a still a control, whilst at the same time there is pass through. You're not you're not entirely in a world as we've known where only the deposit facility rate matters. You know, it will be the anchor, but you will be able to see some movement. So I really like this paper. Maybe yeah. Yeah, Michael. one comment. One comment about uh, when Esther will uh, trade above the deposit rate. It's linked to the absolute level of excess liquidity, but it's also linked to uh, how this liquidity is spread between countries and banks, and uh, and very linked to fragmentation. So uh, uh, we've seen in the past that that. Uh, that this liquidity was maybe uh, not spread in all banks or not all countries, uh, and that we had some issues there. So uh, on that front, maybe uh, target two figures that uh, gives uh, some indication or where the, where this liquidity is currently parked. Uh, so uh, pretty difficult to to say, as Camille said, uh, what is the amount that, that will uh, make a shift uh, to, to the Esther fixing. Yeah, but it seems that market sees this as pretty far away in time and that the DFR so far remains the anchor. I mean, by the way, uh, we have recently, I'm sure you've seen in the package of monetary policy decisions of last week, there was also a change in the remuneration of minimum reserves uh, from the MRO rate to the DFR. And this is also in recognition that the DFR is currently the market rate and basically aligning the remuneration of minimum reserves uh, to uh, the, the market rates in order to make it neutral. Yeah. Um, so maybe on this note, we can then transition to the second topic we have to for today, which is more on the market structure of money markets. And, and that will touch upon uh, the scarcity of collateral that we already mentioned, and then extending to market liquidity and the fragile market liquidity we are experiencing uh, since, uh, since basically uh, regulatory uh, reform has been uh, implemented. So starting with collateral scarcity, and a lot has been um, discussed recently on that, uh, we wanted to, to go into you know, the structural drivers for uh, demand of collateral in money markets. So how do money markets square this kind of uh, unbalance uh, between the large amount of excess liquidity and the scarce collateral that we have today, especially in terms of safe assets. Um, and if we look forward, um, can we be satisfied that uh, with normalization um, of both uh, the, the balance sheet uh, of central banks and excess liquidity, uh, the, uh, the, the collateral will be returned uh, to the market? Or are there elements that tell you that scarcity might persist even after uh, uh, balance sheet normalization uh, has started. 
uh, because there are other effects at play. Yeah. So, for example, higher rates uh, would would translate, and higher rates, but also volatility, would translate into uh, valuation effects, would translate into margin calls, and all of this fuels the demand uh, for collateral at the same time. So, what's what's your view on that? And and and. Uh, uh, maybe I'll turn to Camille to start, but please feel free, all of you, to to give a you know a view on that. Camille. Yes, indeed, that there are various uh, drivers of the demand for collateral, uh, as you said, Imen. Uh, I think, firstly, the short positioning in the market is obviously one of the driver. So, as we have seen this year, customers will borrow securities to sell them if they expect rates to rise. So that dimension is particularly important in a hiking cycle. Uh, the other one is also foreign central banks managing their uh, foreign uh, reserves. So they will buy short-term assets or borrow through the repo markets. That will also have an impact. And uh, as you uh, have said, clearly initial margin calls, very important indeed. So CCPs uh, request high-grade collateral, not cash mostly uh, even require core bonds. Same with unclear derivatives position where bonds tend to, to be the trend, to be, to be the norm more than cash. Um, so now looking to next year, for example, you could argue that perhaps the first factor, so short positioning could ease um, because maybe we will finally reach the terminal rate uh, on the ECB and therefore there will perhaps be less positioning for a further uh, rise in rates and therefore maybe less demand of collateral from that perspective. But for example, when it comes to the demand for collateral with CCP, I think it is probably going to stay. Uh, and the second factor, so foreign central bank reserves, I think it's uh, quite an important one. Uh, it can very well continue to weigh in the first half of 2023. Uh, especially if we englobe uh, also government, uh, as we know, the remuneration of government deposit has changed, uh, but it is only until the end of April 2023. So at the moment, you still have 580 billions of government deposit in the Eurozone. On top of that, you have about 500 billions of non-government deposits and or of foreign deposits. And the risk is that as you go into next year, these are gradually rebalanced in the market for perhaps better return. And if that were to be the case, then you will have another strong appetite for collateral and less demand for cash. Uh, so I think in total, it's looking like it's not completely certain. So it's true that on the TLTRO side, as these are going to be repaid, we will have uh, some collateral coming back to the market. But what we know is that you don't have more than 200 billions of government bonds that have been placed at the ECB as collateral for the TLTRO. So um, it's not like big compared to the whole TLTRO size. Uh, and then if you think in terms of QT, you could argue that QT will help uh, given that when the ECB starts, we will have less reinvestments. But I think what we need to bear in mind is that when it comes to QT in the Eurozone, it's mostly uh, a question for the APP. So we will see a passive roll-off of the APP program. And therefore, in terms of size, we are talking uh, on average about 28 billion per month as a maximum across all assets, across all jurisdictions. So you know, when we think in terms of German collateral, which has been particularly squeezed this year, and it has been particularly squeezed because the free float in Germany has dropped to extremely low levels. Uh, we think it's uh, probably around 10%. Uh, QE has been one of the reasons why it is so low, but clearly not the only one. Uh, so there is only, um, so going back to QT, 28 billion across assets, across jurisdictions, it might not be a game changer for German asset swap or German repo rates, I think. I think supply will be a more important driver as we start the new year, but on balance, QT might not be having so much of an impact. And I think that going back to the US and UK experience, what is quite telling there is that in the UK, where they have completely dropped the reinvestment at the beginning of the year, 
and where they even have started active sales. If you look at asset swap, they are still very expensive. The only place where asset swap and repo rates are much more normal is actually in the US. And in the US, as we have discussed previously, there is a reverse repo facility, uh, which is very different in nature from the uh, current PEP and APP facilities that we have in place in the Eurozone. It's different in terms of, well, the PEP and APP facility is a, is a backstop facility. There is no fixed cost for it. The reverse repo facility in the US, there is a fixed cost. It's within the corridor. It's open to non-banks. And therefore, the Fed is intermediating the market. Uh, and one of the reasons as well why you have uh, a squeeze of collateral, even though you have different channels lending securities, is that when it comes to the Eurozone uh, or other regions as well, lending in the repo market has a cost. It's intensive in terms of balance sheet. Uh, so it's interesting that in the US where the Fed is intermediating securities at a fixed rate within the corridor, that the place where asset swap are looking much more normal. Now, exactly. Except that, you know, one of the, the kind of um, goals of normalization is, is also to say, well, market intermediation somehow should come back, yeah, and should gradually replace central bank intermediation. But somehow you're telling us that uh, we're just having central bank intermediation in the US by another name, yeah. <laughs> It seems, um, but opening it up to others as well, maybe more optimistic views. <laughs> Think about the, the standing repo facility, uh, just to maybe calm down the enthusiasm a little bit. Um, it's not so much the size, but there is an issue there in terms of counterparties, right? It's still open only to the primary dealer. Uh, and the banks essentially. So it's not open to the entire market. So the floor of your IRP is open to money market funds. Uh, so beyond the banking sector, but the, the standing repo facility, you have to be a primary dealer. So it's still required intermediation of, of banks uh, balance sheet, if you want, should there be pressure in the, in the repo market. So it's untested in some sense. It wasn't there in September 19. So it's clearly it's a step in the, a very good step in that direction. But whether banks in times of stress will be willing to intermediate for their clients and put their balance sheet at use, that's something that needs to be seen, obviously, uh, but we haven't seen it yet. So maybe we can broaden even more the market structure discussion and go into, you know, market uh, liquidity. Because um, it's been said many times that uh, one of the characteristics of the, the post uh, great financial crisis environment is it's more fragile uh, market liquidity with bottlenecks uh, in the intermediation capacity of dealers. Yeah. And, and the conversation on that is very live at the moment, uh, for example, on the US Treasury market, yeah, where these fragilities have been basically identified and, and that there are even a kind of interagency uh, effort in order to address them. However, it's taking quite some time. So, I mean, do you think that these fragilities that are present uh, uh, probably in some form in a number of, of uh, bond markets and also money markets have negative uh, repercussions on uh, the capacity of central banks to normalize yeah, their policies? And, and how do you assess the role that regulatory changes have had on uh, market liquidity in, in the past decade? And, and do you see there a difference between the US and, uh, and the Euro area? And le let me start by, um, by Eric and Dad and then turn to Mikhail and Fabio. Thank you very much, Imani. Yeah, in, indeed, this is a question that, uh, that is very dear to me as well. The, um, when you when you do market making, you need to have uh, inventory. You need to be able to warehouse warehouse risk, internalize risk. And uh, one of the key regulatory changes that we've seen over the past decade has been the uh, uh, interdiction or the banning of prop proprietary trading. Um, and um, 
The question for me is uh, whether this regulation has potentially not left a gap in the market structure. So that's, that's, that's really, because I do not necessarily see the replacement, uh, the ability that some financial institutions had to intermediate without uh, going into uh, an externalization of the risk. And this internalization of risk for me is key. It provides a lot of liquidity regardless of the market. So that's, that's one key element. Perhaps as a, a, a secondary element, which is linked also to this uh, regulation, is, um, uh, is there an unintended consequence vis-a-vis -vis uniformization or, uh, of behaviors? Because if you, if you start to remove, as this regulation did, the appetite for risk in some institutions, do you make them more like the others? And therefore, do you end up having more, a more uniform landscape with more uniform behaviors and therefore group exit, uh, you know, a group rush towards the exit. So that's for me, it, the question then becomes, has there been, because of this or indirectly or potentially, uh, a, the creation of an underlying uh, uh, systemic risk. So that would be another one. Then uh, perhaps going back to one of the points we discussed and the difference in regulations between market actors. If you look at the fact that for banks, short dated NBFI, so when I say short dated, overnight NBFI deposits have no LCR value. Uh, actually, they're even a cost, uh, no SFR value. Uh, leverage ratio is impacted because you blow, you grow your balance sheet, these kind of things. But at the same time, as Michael uh, was saying, uh, they are forced to be liquid and therefore hold a, a certain amount of uh, their assets under management into very short dated deposits. So there is a little bit of a contradiction and it's, it's not necessarily helping, but it's, it's very difficult to tackle at the same time. Uh, another one, um, if you look at the leverage ratio, uh, the cost on the balance sheet pretty much, uh, is it perhaps one of its in unintended consequences that when combined with the general risk aversion that has been growing past the global financial crisis, the interbank intermediation has all but disappeared. If you look at the Euribor statistics, you can see that um, besides the one week, level one contribution is minimal, yeah, under 20%. And the further out you go, it goes even lower. So overall, for me, the feeling I, I have is that uh, even though the regulations are necessary and they've made the balance sheets of the financial sector and banks in general a lot more robust, for me, the question is, have they, made, perhaps, have they perhaps made them also less flexible, more costly, and therefore more difficult to manage and deploy? Absolutely. So I'd like to leave a little bit for questions. So uh, maybe I turn to Michael. If you if you bear with me, I'll turn to Fabio first, and then we'll open up for questions. And I'm sure you'll be able to also chip in for questions, Fabio. And you have the last word in in two minutes, and then we open up for questions. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll be very fast. Maybe I'll pick up from the last point that Eric made. I, I think we are in a do, in a, dif, in a different world, right? We are in a world of high inflation, high rates, high vol, and the abrupt change from the two years ago when we were in low rates, low vol, low inflation, that implies that liquidity needs to be priced differently. I think that's the cyclical component of this. People need to realize that liquidity is not free anymore. It's liquidity will have a price. There has to be a liquidity premium that people are willing to pay. And I think that's an important factor that needs to be kept in mind. There are then some structural issues, right? Regulation, market structure, high frequency trading. But the point that liquidity is not as it used to be and needs to be priced, I think it's something that needs to be considered. Otherwise, there are really going to be much more issue in terms of liquidity. I think what we have seen in the UK, for me, it's a warning shot. Uh, it was related to very idiosyncratic UK issues, but it did create all these waves under the surface that popped up in different markets, like credit markets in the US, emerging markets, even asset backed securities in a place as far as Australia. So the big question to, in markets now is what would the Fed do, right? What if this happened in the US? They have tools with that said the standing river facilities one. They could do QE, obviously. Uh, that will create, I think, some communication challenges if you do QT and QE at the same time, as we see in the UK. There's a discussion at US Treasury whether you should do central clearing, whether the SLR should have some carve out for market, market making, for example, uh, or even Treasury buyback. So they're buying back the off the run, so there is more on the run in the market. Um, 
it's all going to be what is the level, optimal level of reserve, and how they get close and how quickly they get there, I think, in the US. But the starting point is that both for structural reason and cyclical reason, people need to realize that liquidity as a price now and need to be pricing it. Fully agree. Yeah. And also the fact that, you know, somehow seeing the return of market volatility is a bit healthy after years of very low volatility and, and means that you know, good risk management uh, by financial institutions is going to make a real difference. Yeah. Uh, on that note, maybe I open up the floor to the audience uh, for questions to our panelists. And we have both online and also in the room. So maybe uh, I can check with those in the room, because I don't see you, whether there's any question already from the audience there. Okay, so I think I, I, I get the, the message uh, that there's no questions in the room. Um, so any any questions also in the in the virtual chat here? So I'm ben, looking. I need, to, I, I need to join a meeting with the managing director. If you don't mind, I will, I will disconnect. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks again for. Okay, so I have one. Uh, thanks very much, Fabio. Thank you very much. Um, so I have one question online, and this is uh, from uh, Sophia, who asks, what are the hurdles for the ECB <laughs> to implement uh, the reverse repo facility? Yeah, um, but that's obviously, I mean, a question that, uh, you know, I, I, I can maybe just uh, say a few words on, uh, but I won't be long because I think it's, it's all about um, uh, I mean, as Fabio has explained, if you want to uh, implement such a facility, you need to think about the design carefully about the design of this facility, both in terms of uh, scope of access, so types of financial institutions that would have access to this facility, and uh, comes with this as well uh, a number of um, operational considerations to take into account in terms of. Uh, you know, this is a facility that would take cash uh, from financial institutions and give back a basket of collateral. So you need to be able also operationally to handle that uh, from a very high number of financial institutions and being able uh, to provide, um, you know, GC type collateral, uh, which in the um, operational setup that we have in the euro area with a decentralized um, implementation of monetary policy and also therefore um, an decentralized uh, posting of collateral uh, by, by financial institutions and same thing about uh, the asset purchases that are implemented on a decentralized uh, basis. Uh, it's something that requires careful uh, consideration and is, is more difficult to, um, to, to implement than I would say in the case of a single jurisdiction like the Fed. But, uh, but my understanding is that even at the Fed, uh, basically designing this facility back, um, back in 2013-14 uh, you know, required quite a lot of work uh, and it's still being adjusted um, regularly. So, uh, so, so long story short, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those you know, monetary policy measures uh, that requires a careful consideration of both the, uh, the objective, uh, the operational considerations, potentially also legal considerations uh, regarding the ability of financial institutions to you know, access the facility in compliance with their own regulatory setup. Um, let me check if we have further questions here. Okay, so now there's a question in the room. Okay, so I'm, I'm switching between different chats, so, you know, bear with me. Uh, go on for the question in the room. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was wondering, because there were discussions on um, ECB bills or some very... Um, some very small whispers going around. Um, do you think this would do anything when it comes to intermediation, when it comes to ECB um, bills, if you issue those? 
And uh, do you think this is something which would be feasible also to um, ease just a strain on funding we have seen generally? Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not going to be answering all the questions, so maybe I kind of turn it over also to our panelists uh, uh, to, to basically address this question on bills. Would it help with the question of scarcity and the market structure issues we have discussed? Maybe I can start on this one. Uh, that's something uh, we are contemplating or we are thinking about, uh, like the reverse repo facility. As we know that there are some um, regulatory constraints that will take time to be adjusted or maybe won't be adjusted at all, uh, that's a way to go around, the, or, uh, around it and, and maybe uh, bring some fluidity in the market. Because anyway, it's very intimidated by banks. Banks don't count or don't want to take our cash. Uh, so another way to do it is going directly to the ECB via the reverse repo facility or uh, going to the ECB via bills. And then it's a question of uh, remuneration. Uh, is it competitive versus existing in issues uh, we see at quarter end and your end uh, more specifically we lost the sound for a moment uh michael so uh I, I and i think i wasn't the only one uh but if you can repeat very quickly so you, what you said i think we lost you when you were saying that it, you also have to look at the price of the bills yeah yeah, it will depend on the price of the bill versus existing instruments like overnight deposit, reverse yeah. repo, or T-bills. So uh, if uh, it brings the floor to the market, but it doesn't uh, put aside uh, other uh, market instruments, then it will work pretty well. But it's good to have a floor anyway, because uh, there is an asymmetry currently in the market with uh, some uh, investors that don't have access to the ECB uh, and have no floor with the deposit rate and, 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 and the banking system in a way and some specific clients that have access to the ECB or have a floor with banks. So I would say uh, uh, if it can fix it and avoid the, the regulatory uh, dis discrepancies, then it, it would be good. Yeah, no, and I see your point about the floor. That's an important point because when you compare it with the Fed, because there's no, you know, bill issuance for the Fed, there's actually a soft floor. I mean, the overnight RP is a soft floor, yeah. And you still have a number of money market rates that are trading below, yeah, and the bills in particular. Uh, the SNB, by contrast, has both. And I think this is an interesting experience to look at. And actually, the pricing of, you know, the SNB, you have to look at the different maturities, but the pricing of SNB bills and uh, an equivalent overnight uh, reverse repo is not exactly the same. So there's something to dig it, to dig out uh, also from this experience. Um, so let me, I have still a number of questions on, uh, on ECB debt certificates. Let me turn to the other panelists to see if you would like to add something, maybe Eric or Camille. So we discussed. Uh, so I can't. I can't really comment on the discussion that took place in the money market contact group. But um, just speaking uh, for myself, uh, indeed, the the question of the ECB uh, issuing bills is something that I was wondering at the time, exactly along the same lines as Michael, uh, because uh, eventually, where do the uh, non-bank FIs? Uh, where can they park? the excess euros that they have, especially on difficult dates where banks are constrained, as we already discussed in the panel, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the deployment of their balance sheet. And then it, it's, it shouldn't be, I believe it is part of the uh, instruments allowed under the ECB uh, rules. So it would be, I think it would be an instrument to think about. I, yeah, I really like the idea. And maybe it would be simpler to implement than reverse repo facility. Um, that, that's also one of the questions suggesting that on the chat from Christoph Rieger, yeah. Um, Camille, anything to add on this uh, topic? 
Uh, we hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, because I, I have completely lost connection for a while. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I, I've just uh, heard the last 30 seconds. Uh, I mean, on our side, I, I think I, I completely understand indeed the complexity um, of having a reverse repo facility in the Eurozone. It's very different. It's a Euro system. Uh, so it's very, com it's more complex than, than in the US for sure. Um, there is also, for example, a question of cost. How do you fix the rate for different bonds? Uh, the ECB only holds 10% of the portfolio. So how do you factor that into account? Uh, can each EC NCBs have uh, their, uh, can we centralize a, a, a reverse repo facility across NCBs and ECB uh, or not? Uh, because otherwise we are back to just 10% of the entire portfolio, which is uh, not very large. So it's true that we have also thought on our side uh, about bills. Uh, it certainly has a lot of merit. Uh, and in, in particular, again, as I was saying earlier, uh, in the first half of 2023, if the remuneration of these deposits is going back to be 0%, um, for us, there is definitely a risk that we could see the sort of market impact that we had seen during the summer, where we had a completely uh, negative correlation between the market pricing, so Esther swap and bills and short-term bonds of certain countries which was suggesting at the time that there was really an issue with the, with the transmission of monetary policy. So in the first half of uh, 2023, given that there is one trillion at stake, maybe it will be much less by then, but uh, for us, it, it's true that perhaps bills could be uh, in the near term, uh, would help alleviate any tensions that we could have at the time if a large portion of that cash is rebalanced to the market. We can't hear you, Imen. Uh, yeah. That should be a bit better. No, I was just saying that, uh, indeed, thanks for these thoughts, because I think that uh, the purpose of the collateral scarcity discussion was also, you know, the structural elements of it. And, and so you set it up in the right um, context i would say so thanks very much i mean i see a number of other questions now coming up on the chat uh and don't worry your questions are not lost we we, we heard them and i certainly read them yeah uh but we won't be able to address them today because the panel is coming to an end and uh very sorry for that but uh, as usual we we try to stick to the to, we try to stick to the time um, so let me uh, invite you actually to uh, reconnect uh, tomorrow. So we're going to close the conference for today and uh, uh, we're going to invite everybody to connect again uh, tomorrow at 9.15 yeah, for the conference um, continuation. And a lot of interesting topics again, uh, including you know looking again at bank intermediation, at safe assets, and uh, and 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 also the digital aspects of it. So uh, stay tuned, stay with the conference, and uh, and see you all, all tomorrow. Thank you very much to all my panelists for the great discussion we just had. Yeah, and I wish everybody a very nice evening as well. Bye. Indeed, Thank you, everyone. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. 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 Yeah.